Welcome to worship at Northfield United Methodist Church. It is a joy to have you with us. I'm Pastor Rachel McIver Morey. If you're watching with us at one of our 9.30 a.m. Sunday watch parties, either on Facebook or in online.church, do sign into the chat box, let us know you're here. And if you're watching some other time, just throw us a comment or drop us a line some other way. We would love to know that you're worshiping with us. We pray that God and grace meet you exactly where you find yourself today. Come, let us worship. Today's prayer is modified from Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver, former pastor of St. James United Methodist Church in Kansas City. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Eternal God, we bow before your throne of grace as we leave behind the politically and socially clamorous year of 2020. We gather now in our homes before you to inaugurate another chapter in our roller coaster civic life. Control our tribal tendencies and quicken our spirits that we may feel thy priestly presence even in moments of heightened disagreement. May we so feel your presence that our service to each other may not be soiled by any utterances or acts unworthy of followers of Jesus. Insert in our spirit a light so bright that we can see ourselves and our politics as we really are, soiled by selfishness, perverted by prejudice, and inveigled by ideology. Now may the God who created the world and everything in it bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Peace in our families. Peace across this land. And peace, Lord, in those places in our lives, even where we experience the most conflict, now and evermore. And Lord, in this silence, we pray for your peace and we hold up those places in our lives where we call for more of it. Lord, for your having heard us and heard our calls for peace, we give you thanks. For the peace that you have brought to our souls through your presence and your word, we give you thanks. For the peace which you have brought to us with your teachings, we give you thanks as we remember your teachings and we pray now together that prayer which you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi guys, it's Pastor Rachel and it's time for our children's moment. And today, what I'd like to talk about is a big idea. And that big idea is called Beloved Community. I'm going to say that again, Beloved Community. Now let's break that down a little bit. Beloved means to be loved. Beloved. Be loved. Isn't that great? And, it, and so we know right away that this is already about love. And community is about people together. So it's about people living together in love, in real love. And this is an idea that was a big idea for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It didn't start with him, but it was an idea that he believed that God was calling us toward as a people. So that people, no matter what their background, their skin color, could live together in genuine love and genuine community without anybody having more rights than anybody else and with everybody able to love everybody else and give fully of themselves. Another way to think of it is that the idea was about creating a really, really big us. How big is your us? I want you to think about that. Is it the people in your family, in your house, in Northfield? Is it uh, the people in your community? How big is the us that you think of when you think of it? Because the good news about beloved community is that there isn't a limit to the size. It can be as big as we are prepared to love for. And as we celebrate the legacy and the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this week, uh, a pastor from Atlanta who helped lead in the civil rights movement and whose work continues today, we can think about how big the us is that God is calling us toward. And uh, this week, as you think about how big your us is, I want you to dream about how big we can make it be. I can't wait to see you soon. This morning's reading is 1 Corinthians 1, chapters 10 through 17, and reads as follows. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus, and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did not baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so the cross of Christ might not be empty of its power. During the season of Epiphany, we are walking with Paul and we are walking with the book Humankind by Rutger Bregman as we consider the good within, the good that God has created in humankind from the very beginning. What's happened to it and how do we reclaim it? Today, let's start by talking about oxytocin. Maybe you know some things about oxytocin. It's the bonding chemical in the human brain. It's the thing that flares when we're with people we like and feel connected to. And so this is the chemical that shows up when we feel compelled to do something uh, really heroic or really um, uh, sacrificial for somebody else. This is the chemical that is triggered also when we do those things that cause us to uh, tell people later, you know, I think I got more out of that experience than the person I was trying to help. That's the chemical we're talking about, oxytocin. So with this chemical that flares in our brains when we do good things for others, you'd think nothing bad would ever happen to anybody. 
And no, that is not what happens, and we know that. And a 2010 Amsterdam study confirmed that oxytocin is also triggered uh, not just by these moments of, of joy, connection, and service. It is also triggered when we are, uh, find ourselves in an encounter with someone we have determined is outside our group. So it is also triggered when we strengthen our bonds with those we feel kinship with over against someone we see outside ourselves. How does this play out? In 1944 and 1945, Morris Janowitz was commissioned uh, by the uh, British government to interview German prisoners of war to determine what makes a Nazi soldier work. And the propaganda up to this point had depicted German soldiers as machine-like, as ruthlessly efficient, or as Huns rampaging and doing horrible things. And so the stereotype of a German soldier in much of the propaganda and of the journalism of the time really depicted German soldiers as sort of being almost a different species than, uh, than soldiers on the other side. And so Morris Janowitz was commissioned to figure out what made soldiers uh, in Nazi Germany tick by interviewing these POWs. He found something that startled him and rocked the whole uh, uh, establishment within the British military in their understanding of what made the other side tick and keep going in battle. Because in the course of these interviews, what, um, what Janowitz discovered was that the German high command had done an excellent job of keeping friends together. People from similar towns, people with shared interests, whatever the bond was, German high command tracked that and made sure that the people who were in the trenches together, so to speak, were people who were also in the trenches together in life outside of the war. One of the POWs who was interviewed even sort of shook his head and scoffed at the notion of Nazi ideology. And he said, Nazism starts 10 miles behind the front line. What Janowitz discovered was that many of the frontline soldiers who were fighting in this war from the German side of things weren't motivated by a strong commitment to the ideology of Nazism. They were motivated by fighting for their friend or their brother or their, uh, somebody who lived close by, a neighbor, who was fighting right next to them. And so in the course of this study, what Janowitz discovered was that the German soldiers were actually motivated by the same things that his side were motivated by. Fellowship, loyalty, fellow bonds between soldiers. And that was a new insight for the uh, British military establishment at the end of World War II. Because this oxytocin bond is triggered not just when we uh, find ourselves feeling really connected with those we are with, it is also triggered by an identification with them as a group over against someone else in another group. What do we do with that? We go to scripture and we find Paul writing his letter to the Corinthians. The section of Corinthians that was read for us today is a section where Paul, uh, you can almost hear the rolling eyes through the words he's writing, sort of derides the way that some in the Corinthian church have identified as being disciples of Apollos or apostles of, uh, of Peter or as apostles of him or apostles even of Christ. In this section, Paul is clear that this is not a division which makes any sense at all. Don't divide yourself into teams along these lines. We wouldn't divide, your, divide you guys into teams this way. And he is clear that this is not the way we form the Christian we. The Christian we is bigger than the individual team that Paul saw that the Corinthian church was breaking up and dividing into. Paul's point is that for the Corinthian Christians, their we was too small. Their oxytocin bonds were triggered by too small a group of people around them. 
they needed to expand the we of the church that they identified with. And as a consequence of this, Paul hoped that the church in Corinth would understand itself to be a body itself, not a body divided, but a body connected to itself, to each other. The oxytocin bond that is triggered when we encounter another, that is also triggered by when we have these bonds. So the task of the Christian church in building the body is to build a bigger we. And that is a word to us today. Think of the language we have used during the pandemic. If you're going to be encountering somebody or, or doing life with somebody uh, during the pandemic, make sure you form a bubble, <laughs> right? We've, we've talked about forming bubbles. And that's for uh, quarantining purposes and for uh, social distancing purposes and are really important uh, for how we're making our time through this pandemic together. But outside of the use of the word bubble for the pandemic season, we have also used it to describe the media environments we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in a bubble or an echo chamber where all we hear are like-minded folks who are speaking back to us uh, with the, the same ideas and same thoughts, same way of living in many respects uh, that we ourselves have. The Christian task in this environment is to grow the we. It's to grow the number of people who trigger that oxytocin bond for us, not in an over against sense where we find ourselves in enmity with somebody else, but rather growing the number of people we would lay down our lives for, growing the number of people we would do remarkable acts of service for, growing the number of people that we feel that connected kinship with because those are God's beloved children too. I wanna give you a beautiful, sweet example from Northfield's own history. Pastor Jared uh, did some research some time back uh, for, uh, as he was coming into leadership in the Northfield Area Interfaith Alliance, which is our ecumenical alliance of faith leaders here in town, about the beginnings of the organization. And like all organizations, it's been through various iterations and formations over the years. There was a point uh, earlier in the 20th century when uh, they did, when this alliance, so this is faith leaders, pastors, and so on and so forth uh, all around Northfield, they did a survey of the people in Northfield. And they discovered that while many people in Northfield uh, at that time professed some sort of faith, uh, that at least a, a good chunk of them weren't connecting with any body or any congregation anywhere. And do you know what these pastors and faith leaders did? They went out two by two. Lutherans with Methodists. Can you believe it? And they went door knocking together. And they went door knocking and introduced themselves as pastors in town and handed folks at the door a list of congregations and said, we would love to see you at any of our congregations any Sunday. That is the equivalent of Paul and Apollos and all these other guys listed in Paul's letter going door to door in the Corinthian church saying, hey, hey, hey. We're in this together. We are on the same team. We have the bond, the oxytocin bond that we would lay down ourselves for another. You don't get to divide us up. That's a great example from Northfield's own history that says how we can grow the we. The good news for us today is that this is not a new task. If it were a new task, it wouldn't have happened before when Paul was writing to Corinth. That wouldn't have happened in Northfield in the early 20th century. And it wouldn't be happening now. This is always the task of the body of Christ to grow the we of love and life in the name and the light of Jesus Christ. Who is your we at this point? How big is it? What would it look like to expand that by one? What about by two? Let's start there and see how far we go. Amen.
how big is your we? Paul exhorted the Corinthian church to grow theirs, and maybe it's time for us to grow ours too. Let's get started. <music>